The World Tomorrow. Herbert W. Armstrong, bringing you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. And greetings, friends. This is Herbert W. Armstrong with the good news of the world tomorrow. Yes, I mean good news. I've been telling you what's prophesied to happen to the United States. We are destined to be at the head of all the peoples, all the nations of this earth for a thousand years, but not until after we have learned some very serious lessons. We have a great tribulation to live through first. We have to be brought to our senses, to a realization of the true values of life, the ways of life that bring about a permanent peace, prosperity, and happiness inside of every heart. And actually, happiness is within. Happiness is inside. And happiness does not consist of mere economic prosperity or things of that sort at all. We have many lessons to learn. I've shown you how God Almighty is going to punish us as a loving father punishes his own child to teach us a lesson that we refuse to learn any other way. He's going to use the modern outgrowth of an ancient and an evil nation to teach us that lesson, just as God Almighty in times of old, as you read in your Bible, used evil nations and evil powers to punish his people. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. He's going to use the same method with us. And he's going to use the modern 20th century daughter of the ancient Babylon, the most ancient paganized system that has ever existed on the earth, and the core and the root of that thing exists still today. Now, we found this power, which is actually now, in these days, the resurrected Roman Empire, it's right now in process of being reorganized and of coming to life. It's still underground. The people still don't realize that it's coming. Although if you know what to look for, you can see every bit of it being formed right now by a union of ten dictatorships that are to be formed in Europe and the Mediterranean area as foretold in Isaiah 47 and in Revelation 17 and Revelation 18. Now, we've been going through all of that. But even after that, my friends, we're going to learn our lesson. We're going to return to our God. We profess God. We say a lot about God. We make mention of God in our prayers, but our hearts are not in our prayers. We call Jesus Christ Lord, but we don't do what he said. And Lord means the master whom we obey. We call him the master that we obey, but we refuse to obey him. Jesus said, Why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? No, we teach we don't have to obey. We teach that Jesus, like a smart aleck young man, knew more than his father and did away with his father's laws, not knowing that he and the Father are one and that he is the very Word of God who gave the laws of God to ancient Israel. He is the rock that was with ancient Israel and that followed Israel. And that rock, as you read in your New Testament, was Christ who became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, we have some lessons to learn. Well, we're going to learn them, and we're going to return to our God, and then we're going to have blessings for 1,000 years as long as human flesh endures on this earth. And in that time, we're going to find salvation, and we're all going to be changed to immortality. I don't mean every individual. That isn't what I mean. It, I, I mean it in the same sense the Bible says. When it says that all Israel shall be saved, it doesn't mean every individual in Israel. Well, I mean it just the way the Scripture does exactly. Now, great glory and great blessings are coming. We're going to have to be spanked. We're going to have to be punished. We're going to have to learn our lessons. There is a way that leads to these things. God Almighty has set laws in motion. Laws that bring about certain results. There's a cause for every result. And the result always follows. And what we sow, we have to reap. Why don't you look around you, my friends, and see what we're reaping now? And then why don't you look at the cause and see what we've been sowing at our forefathers before us that are bringing the results that we're reaping now? We're not very happy, and we're, we're having all kinds of heartaches and headaches and suffering and fears and worries and everything else. Well, now, for some time, we've been going through the 50th and 51st chapters of Jeremiah, showing what God is then going to do to this evil power that he calls, under the symbolic name of Babylon, 
which is the, not the ancient Babylon of 600 years before Christ, but the daughter of that ancient Babylon. And it's this modern power that I say is now rising up. I don't expect very many of you even to believe that. But I do expect that many of you are going to remember that you heard it, and when it happens, then you'll know that God sent his messenger to tell you of the truth. And uh, don't think I don't understand the Bible and that just what you've heard and taken for granted is the truth and because I give you something different, I don't know what I'm talking about. Listen, I speak by the authority of Jesus Christ. Well, now we've gone through the 50th chapter of Jeremiah. I have shown you that this Babylon is to be captured at the very time when Christ comes to liberate Israel from captivity and to take his people Israel. And I don't mean this to Jewish people, I mean Israel. The Jewish people are Judah, and Israel and Judah are going together at that very hour, wending their way, weeping in search of the eternal, their God. How God is going to send a horde of nations from north of Jerusalem, which means the territory that today is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. In other words, the Soviet Union from the Kremlin in Moscow, Russia. The hordes of communist Russia are going to come, a horde of nations, to battle her mightily, this modern daughter of the ancient Babylon. Now it's the time of the eternal's vengeance, just exactly as you read in Revelation 18, just prior to the second coming of Christ, the time that climaxes in the second coming of Christ. Israel is going back to her homestead. It's the time when we'll seek for guilt in Israel and in Judah, and there will be none, because it's the time when the Deliverer has come to Zion and turned away on godliness from Israel and from Judah, and when all Israel shall be saved. Now, uh, we've gone through all of that. Uh, it's the time when the whole world is going to live at peace. Verse 34 in Jeremiah 50. And uh, the power that is going to attack uh, this Babylon, because God is going to punish them for their evil, after he has forced them in their evil ways to punish us, to teach us a very valuable lesson. I tell you, you know, sometimes suffering and punishment is a good thing. It doesn't feel good at the time, but... When it works out its purpose later, we see it's been a very fine thing. I know some people would like to have me torn apart limb from limb for telling you what's going to happen to the United States of the punishment that's coming on us in order that we may learn such a valuable lesson. And I think sometimes there are some mothers that when their children are disobeyed, they wait till the father comes home, their husband comes home at night, and they say, now, uh, uh, Daddy, I want you to punish little Johnny. He's been a naughty boy. He didn't... Obey me today. And then when Daddy begins to punish him, Mom takes his part and would like to tear Daddy apart limb from limb for punishing little Johnny. Well, uh, I think a lot of people might feel that way and might despise me and hate me because I'm telling you what's coming. My friends, the people won't listen to the preaching when God sends his ministers preaching his truth. We aren't going to obey God. No, we'll still go on preaching that God's law is done away that we can do what we please and be under grace, that grace means license to do what you please. Let your conscience be your guide. That's what so many of us believe today, that God's going to have to knock that out with some real punishment. Well, you'll see who the false prophets are, my friends, when that time comes. You go on believing I am the false prophet right now, but just let this stick in your mind, and when it happens, you'll know that God sent his faithful minister to teach you his truth. God Almighty says, cry aloud and spare not, and show my people their sins, their iniquities. It isn't very popular. It isn't what people want. It isn't what people want to believe, but it's the truth of God. And, well, every one of you that will wake up and will heed the warning, if you will pray always, and if you'll be watching these things, and if you will surrender to God and to obey God, you will be spared, and in the punishment that is coming on our people, you will not be punished. God is only going to punish those people in our nation that need the lesson, that refuse to learn it any other way. If you learn that lesson, you will not have to be punished to learn it. God has promised us a way of protection through these times to come, that it won't come near us. No plague will come nigh your dwelling if you will heed the warning and believe what God says. Well, now we come down to the 51st chapter, and we've been getting started in that. And uh, let me see. God says here he's turning up destroyers against Babylon. Woe betide her everywhere on the day of her doom. Spare none of her soldiers. Annihilate her army. 
Now, it is a whole system of civilization that includes the political system and the military system as well as others. And here she has an army. It's speaking of her cities, she is, they're going to be stabbed in their streets. Their land is full of guilt against his majesty of Israel. But Israel and Judah are not bereft of their God, the Lord of hosts. For fly from Babylon, every man of you, save your lives, share not her doom. Read Revelation 18.4 and uh, uh, other places, and you'll see that same identical thing. Revelation 18.4. And then uh, here in verse 45 of this, Come out of her, my people. Save your lives, every one of you. That's quoted in Revelation 18.4. Come out of her, this modern Babylon. We're in it because, my friends, it's a system. It isn't just a nation with a boundary line and a local government. It's a way of life. It's the way that God epitomizes under the symbolic title of Babylon. And it includes the way of doing what seems right in our eyes. It's the way of a deceived people. Sure, we're good people. Sure, we, we do what we think is right. But we don't always think right. And God says the way to find him is to let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to God because God's ways and God's thoughts are not like ours. Well, so we're told to fly from Babel and every one of us, save your lives, share not her doom. Well, if you will avoid these sins, God won't punish you. So, God says, fly from Babylon. In other words, that isn't getting into a different geographical location that's coming out of the way of living that uh, people live. Every man of you, save your lives, share not her doom. It is the hour of the eternal's vengeance. He is rendering her due punishment. If you've read the book of Revelation, you know how it climaxes in Revelation 17 and 18 about the doom on this modern Babylon. Once Babylon was a golden cup that made the whole world drunk. The nations drank her wine. Now, Revelation 17, 4. Let me just turn to that real quickly and, and uh, read it for you. In Revelation 17, 4, here is this Babylon. In verse 5, she's called Mystery Babylon the Great. And in verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a cup in her hand full of abominations of the filthiness of her fornication. Well, verse 2, with her all the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Same Babylon, same thing is talking about exactly that you read back here now in Jeremiah 51. Once Babylon was a golden cup. Yes, there she is, having a golden cup in her hand, verse 4 of Revelation 17. She made the, all the nations drunk. That's in verse 2 of Revelation 17. And here it is in verse 7 of Jeremiah 51. Suddenly Babylon falls and breaks. Wail for the creature is the question. Get balsam for her wounds. Perhaps she can be cured. No, you answer. We would fain have healed her. But there is no curing Babylon. We must leave her to her fate and all go home. You're going to share the fate with her, my friends. You don't come out of it. And our people are in Babylon today. For her doom rises to heaven, reaches the very skies. What do you read back here in Revelation 18, where he says, Come out of her, my people, in the fourth verse. Come out of her, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. There it is. Anyone that knows Revelation 17 and 18 knows it's speaking about something that's now on the way, that's being built up right over there in Europe and around the Mediterranean area at this very present moment. And we don't realize it. We're even helping the thing along, helping to build the Frankenstein that is being built that God is going to use to punish us. Well, we need the punishment, so we're, we're really having a part in it, aren't we, in a way that we least suspect. Yes, her doom rises up to heaven, reaches to the very skies. The Eternal has made good our cause. Come, let us tell in Zion what the Eternal, our own God, has done. Now, verse 11. Polish your arrows, scour your armor. The Eternal is stirring up Media's king, planning to ruin Babylon. Tis the Eternal's vengeance. It's the time of the day of the Lord. It's the time that climaxes in the second coming of Christ just ahead of us now, my friends. This isn't in the far, far distant future. It was at the time Jeremiah wrote it. 
He wrote this over 2,500 years ago. Now, you and I are living in the time when these things are going to happen. You and I are going to see these things happen. It's going to happen in our lifetime in these very next few years. Of course, I've been going through other things that are going to happen first. And they're going to happen, my friends. I don't care how many people try to laugh it to scorn. I don't care how many skeptics. I don't care how many scoffers. I don't care how they try to ridicule, to jeer, to laugh. I don't care how many names they call me. Now here the Eternal is stirring up media's king, planning to ruin Babylon. This is the Eternal's vengeance. You're going to live into this time and see these things happen. Now, wait a minute. Who is this media and media's king? Let's go back a little bit. The Medes and the Persians conquered the ancient Babylon. And my friends, the people of Media moved on farther north, and the most populous part of Russia and the Ukraine area today is pretty much composed of those people, the descendants of those people. Now, ancient Babylon, actually Babylon was a city. The Chaldean Empire it was an empire, not just a nation of one nationality, but it was an empire of a number of nationalities. They included what was left of the ancient uh, Assyrians of Assyria. Assyria's government had uh, disintegrated and Babylon had taken it over. And there were different nations. There were the Medes and there were the Persians. There were the Assyrians. There were a number of those people. But... The ancient Assyrians pretty largely moved over into Central Europe. And they're the people that uh, formed the ancient Babylon. They are the people, my friends, that are today going to be at the helm and at the head of what is being reformed to resurrect the ancient Roman Empire. If you follow the ancient history of them and their descendants and where they have come. And so it is the Assyrians that are going to really be at the helm of this Babylon, but it's the Medes who moved up into the USSR today that are going to conquer them, just as ancient media conquered ancient Babylon. You see, my friends, there is this picture of duality running through the Word of God. It runs through the prophecies of God. And here again is this thing, it's true, that ordinarily, except when God intervenes, that history repeats itself. And so here it is coming again in our time. Now, the time of the eternal's vengeance is that that's coming. Now, it's true that the ancient Babylon was destroyed, that the city is the thing that ruled over that empire of different nations, and the city of Babylon has been destroyed. There isn't any city there now. God said it would be destroyed. Now, Rome still exists, and Carthage, and, well, I mean, Athens, and uh, uh, many of those ancient cities still exist. Sidon exists, but Tyre doesn't. And uh, that is the ancient Tyre doesn't. They built another city. Actually, it's uh, called by a different name on most maps, but uh, sometimes it's labeled Tyre. And uh, it's out on what used to be an island uh, across from ancient Tyre. Although it's a peninsula now, it's been filled in. And so it goes. Whatever God has said is going to happen. And God said that ancient Babylon would be wiped off the earth, so it has. Damascus is still in existence today, and other cities that did exist in those days. They've lasted here way over 2,000, 2,500 years, some of them, but not Babylon. Well, now here it says he's sending uh, these Medes, or Media's king of this modern day, planning to ruin Babylon. He says here in verse 12, Raise your standards against Babylon, blockade it round and round, post your sentries, lay your ambushes, for the eternal executes his aim, God's aim, God's purpose stands, and no one can stop it. His sentence upon Babylon, throned upon many a stream, notice it, throned upon many a stream, with treasures the team, your end has come, God says to Babylon, your web is spun. The eternal of hosts has sworn by his own life, I fill you full of foes that swarm like locusts and shout in triumph over you. Now, I've been reading this in the Moffat translation that is in more modern English and easier to read, and uh, Moffat leaves out verses 15 through 19. He omits them and doesn't for some reason. I don't know why, but he, he left them out. 
But uh, nevertheless, I'm going to read them because I feel that they should be there. Now, here it is in another translation coming now to verse 15 in Jeremiah 51. It is he who made the earth by his power, that is, it's God who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding, stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens, and he makes the, the mist rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightnings for the rain, and he brings forth the wind from his storehouses. Every man is stupid and without knowledge. Notice that, how true that is. Every man is stupid and without knowledge. That is, compared to God, and we certainly are compared to God. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols, for his images are false, and there is no breath in them. They can't think. They have no power. They don't wield power. They have no authority. And yet men have worshipped things like that. And in a sense, we do today. We worship our automobiles and our nice homes and, and a lot of electrical gadgets and things. We practically worship things like that today. We make idols out of them. Verse 18, they are worthless, absolutely worthless, a work of delusion. Oh, how we set our hearts on things, my friends, that are false. False values, not the true values. Now, it's God's will that we be prospered. It's God's will that we have good material things, that we have good quality, and that we have everything we need. But we set our hearts on things that are worthless instead of setting store by the things that are the real true values because we've lost our way. Now, these things are worthless. Well, he's, of course, he's speaking here of the idols. A work of delusion. At a time of their punishment, they shall perish. The time of the people's punishment, these things will all perish. Not like these is he who is the portion of Jacob, for he is the one who formed all things. And Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord or the Eternal of hosts is his name. Now, coming into verse 20, you, God says, are my hammer and weapons of war. With you I break nations in pieces. With you I destroy kingdoms. With you I break in pieces the horse and his rider. With you I break in pieces the chariot and the charioteer. With you I break in pieces man and woman. With you I break in pieces the old man and the youth. With you I break in pieces the young man and the maiden. And, uh, well, let's uh, not repeat all of that. Here it is, the, the shepherd and his flock, uh, the farmer and his uh, team. I break in pieces governors and uh, commanders. He is speaking there, my friends, actually of Babylon and not of Israel. Now, a lot of people misunderstanding that have thought he was applying that to Israel. Well, my friends, we have inherited the promises of the ancient Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that God made to them, and uh, we have always... Well, we have had the promises that God had made, for instance, back here in Leviticus 26. I've read it to you so many times, where God had said in the days of Moses to uh, the children of Israel, Leviticus 26, If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, that's in verse 3, I'll give you rain in due season. And then he tells about the prosperity that they will have. And I, verse 6, will give you peace in the land. You shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And you shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred, a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. Now, that was if they would obey his commandments. They didn't. And if they wouldn't, God said that these promises would be withheld from them for 2,520 years. In other words, the seven times, that is four times repeated here in Leviticus 26. Now, Israel and Judah of old did not obey God, and so the promises did not come to them. They were withheld for 2,520 years, but now why for just 2,520 years? I'll tell you why, my friends. To bring it down to this modern time, the time when prophecy is being fulfilled, and because God had promised these things unconditionally to Abraham, because Abraham, 430 years before the old covenant was made, 430 years before the law of Moses, and before most people think there weren't any Ten Commandments, but they did exist, because Abraham kept God's commandments, his statutes, his judgments, and his laws, and because of that, God said that the promises were unconditional. 
So, beginning the year of 1800 A.D., those promises came to us. Now, that's true. We've been able, when we were invaded by other nations, to beat them back and to conquer them. Now, God has fulfilled his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Nevertheless, God is here speaking to Babylon. Thus saith the Lord. This is, well, it begins back here in verse 50. The word that the Eternal spoke concerning Babylon. Now, uh, he, my people, he says here, and come out of her, my people. He, he speaks of Israel as my people, but he is speaking here of Babylon. And he's going to use Babylon to hammer us until we are taught a lesson. Then he's going to punish Babylon. Now then, we're getting back again into verse 24, and I think I would rather return once again now to the Moffat translation because it's plainer, and frankly, I mark up my Bible, and I've got it marked here in Moffat a little better than the others because I've used it a little more in here because it's plainer. Yes, the eternal promises, I will let Zion see how I repay both Babylon and the Chaldeans all. Now, Zion, remember, is, well, shall we say the church. It, it shows the spiritual Israelites that are really begotten of God, of whom Christ is the head and the people of God. So he's going to let Zion see how he repays both Babylon and the Chaldeans all for all the wrongs that they did her, that they did Zion. I strike at you, says the Eternal, your volcano ruining the world. I will lay hands on you and level you and leave you all extinct. Men will never get from you any stones for building. You shall be a desolation for all time. Now, the people of the ancient Babylon haven't become a desolation, but the city of ancient Babylon has. But now that's going to happen to this nation, to this place over there in Europe. Oh, I see the time is up. I have to stop right there. So until next time, this is Herbert W. Armstrong saying goodbye, friends. You have heard The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong. 